Okay. So like I said, for several years in a row, Dr. Gamick and I have presented at this session, it's called Diff Difficult Issues in Long-Term Care. And each year we sort of pick our own topic to present. So um, this year I chose constipation um, and management of constipation in long-term care. I know in the past, Dr. Gamick's done seizures. I've done pneumonia in long-term care. I've done DBTs. Um, so it's kind of a variety of, of, of difficult or, or different topics that present as difficult issues. So this again is going to be the management of constipation. I've got no financial rele or relevant financial relationships. So by the end of the presentation, I'm hopeful that you'll be become familiar with the various definitions of constipation and the different classification systems. We all know a lot about constipation, I think, um, because it's one of the most common complaints, I think, in our older adult population and one of the most common reasons I get called from the nursing home. Um, we'll identify when diagnostic testing is appropriate for a workup and when we can just empirically treat. And then we'll look at the most evidence-based treatments. I think this is what I have to offer with the, the lecture more so as I went through all the articles, as many as I could find that have been published on the different treatment regimens we use and what actually has um, evidence behind it versus what is just anecdotal that we use because it's always been used. Um, <clears throat> It's interesting, Dr. Prather, one of our retired GI physicians used to give this lecture for us. Um, and I think I, I there was some take home points that I always held from what she presented. Um, and I think I found a lot of the same articles um, when I was working this up because constipation hasn't really changed much over the years. So a lot of the studies are, are quite old. So how do we, I'm gonna do an informal audience poll here. How do we define constipation? Is it hard stool? Is it difficult to pass stool with straining? Is it stool frequency less than one time a week or stool frequency less than three times a week? Does anyone want to take a guess? Less than one time a week. Okay. So the medical world would define constipation as bowel movement less than three times weekly. But patients often have their own definition, right? They often, if you ask, like, what, what do you mean constipation? They'll define it as hard stool or any sort of straining. But there's many definitions, as you'll see. And so really any of these answers may be partially correct, if not correct. So I'm going to start with a case to a case here. Um, tried to move on my screen. I can see all your pictures and I can't see my words. There we go. An 86-year-old male with a past medical history significant for heart failure, diabetes, um, coronary artery disease, who's had a cabbage, and dementia, who lives in long-term care. The staff note that the patient frequently gets agitated, and he's always asking to go to the bathroom. They'll put him on the toilet, and he often strains. They report that he has a bowel mo movement every few days, in quotation marks. That's usually what I'll hear. It's every few days. It's every couple of days. What is the next best step in management? Um, should we start Miralax? Should we order a KUB? Should we start fiber supplements? Or should we start a stool softener such as DocuSate? What does everyone think? I think Affiliate I, wants you to start with fibers. You would start with fiber? I Anyone? would start with Miralax. Okay. So would I. The correct answer is Miralax. We'll go through the why. Um, fiber is not wrong, but it's probably not as effective as a monotherapy. Okay, so this one, it looks cumbersome, but I'll read it here. So another case. So 75-year-old with a history of spinal stenosis, AFib, gastritis with chronic iron deficiency anemia, osteoporosis, and Parkinson's disease, who's presenting from assisted living to our clinic with a chief complaint of constipation. She wants you to look at her medication list. She wants to know if any of her medicines may be contributing to her difficulty passing stools because I didn't have this problem when I was younger before they put me on all these medications. So what medicines are contributing here? Look at the medication list. You can shout some out. All of the above. Ferris sulfate, tramadol. Calcium. Calcium. Yeah. So I didn't realize, but Cinemax is the anti-Parkinsonian meds are a contributor. Um, Dilthiazin because of the calcium channel block blocker properties. Mm -hmm. The ferrous sulfate, we all know about iron. Of course, the tramadol. The amitriptyline because it has anticholinergic properties. And then the calcium. 
So I made this case up, but doesn't this look like someone you would see? Like I can just see this person in my office with this exact list and, you know, wondering why am I so constipated? So here's my tribute to Dr. Morley. I did email him today to make sure he was going to be on. When I was doing, I sent you guys this article, but when I was doing my research for this talk, I found this chapter he had written in 2007. And I was going to read the first, uh, the first paragraph of the chapter because only Dr. Morley would get away with something like this or would start his textbook chapter like this. So he writes, constipation has plagued human beings since the beginning of time. The first documented treatment for constipation was by a physician to one of the Egyptian pharaohs, and this physician was tasked with curing the pharaoh's constip constipation or going to prison. As he pondered this problem on the banks of the Nile, he observed an ibis take a mouthful of water, bend its long neck around, and squirt it up its anus. He took this as a sign from the god Toth and rushed back to administer the first enema to the pharaoh. Following the cure of the pharaoh's constipation, he was called the, give, he was given the exalted title of guardian of the royal bowel movement. What a wonderful story. And that's a picture on the left of an ibis. I had to look that up. And then the picture on the right is Martin, Martin Luther because Dr. Morley said maybe he was the most famous person to suffer constipation. Um, he uh, wrote a lot of his 95 thesis of rebellion leading uh, Christians away from the Catholic church while he was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> so I just, this was my, my, this was my tribute to Dr. Morley. So just a little background, um, the right colon is a reservoir for mixing and storing contents. Um, the gastrocolic reflex, if you, I, I think about this more in children, but it happens with adults too. I've, I've potty trained a lot of children at this point, by this point, but it begins immediately with PO intake and continues for about two and a half hours after meals. Um, and the same would be true for our older adults. The left colon func functions as a conduit and basically stores the stool. And then the anal canal and rectum maintain fecal continence and enable defecation. So constipation is one of the most common complaints in older adults. Um, it, there's a high impact on quality of life. And I can think of many patients over the years who have been sort of preoccupied with their bowels or who have judged their day by their bowels. You know, you ask them, how's your day going? And they'll say, well, it was really good. It started off good. I had a good bowel movement this morning, you know, and so their day is framed in light of their their constipation or lack of constipation. There's a different definition as I alluded to by, by physician versus patient. And in the medical world, we most often define stool, uh, define constipation as a stool frequency of less than three times a week. For patients though, it's often defined as hard stool with straining on defecation. Um, I've had many patients tell me they're constipated. And then when you ask, well, you know, how often are you going? They'll tell me every day. Um, so in my head, it's always like there's a big disconnect there, but I think the definition is what the patient, you know, makes it out to be in their head. So we have to take into account their definition and that it might not match ours. There's many different classification systems. So we'll go through some of that in the upcoming slides. Um, this is the Rome 4 gastrointestinal disorders of constipation. It's primarily used more in the research setting um, because it relies on um, the results of more standard and more sophisticated testing like um, anomometry, um, which we're not going to do in most patients, but may be appropriate more in the research setting. So with the Rome criteria, you have functional constipation, which we'll talk more about on the next slide. The other name for that is primary constipation. And then irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. And then the third one's opioid-induced constipation. And then the fourth is functional defecation disorders. Um, We'll go through these again in the next slide. And then there's prime, there's the other, the second classification system I saw a lot was primary, which is functional constipation versus secondary. And then there's always the patient versus the healthcare team classification. Um, so primary constipation is also known as functional constipation. And there's three subtypes. So the slow transit um, studies indicate that this is that most people uh, will complain about slow transit, but they in, in, in reality have the same transit time. The resting transit colon time doesn't really differ from patient to patient. What differs is that some people have more of that gastrocolic reflex after meals than others. Um, the normal transit constipation time is the most, uh, most common type. And so in this patient's report, hard stools or other symptoms such as abdominal pain or bloating um, but they have a normal stool frequency. So these are the patients that tell me I'm so constipated and then say they go every day. 
And then disorder defecation or anal rectal dysfunction. I think this is the hardest to treat. Usually this is, this is common in older adults as well. Um, defecation in this is impaired because of um, decreased smooth muscle contraction in the rectum or inability to relax the pelvic floor. Um, they also may not have the urge to defecate even though the rectum is full of stool. So there's diminished receptor response. Um, so this is, is more difficult to treat and may require referral to specialist. Um, secondary constipation is that which is due to underlying chronic disease. So I think like Parkinson's disease or psychosocial factors or medications. So any, any medication induced constipation would fall into the secondary. But what you probably see in our older adults, you probably see a mixture. Um, you know, you can identify these different subtypes probably in many patients. So on the upper right-hand side, there's a diagnostic criteria for primary constipation. So straining during stools, um, incomplete evacuation, sensation of obstruction or blockage, less than three bowel movements per week, or use of manual maneuvers. Um, I, I kind of forget about this. These are kind of uncomfortable topics, but if you ask people, you'll hear more often that they have to use their finger to support their pelvic floor to evacuate their stool. Or I've heard in the nursing home, people using spoons. Um, so this is really uh, probably very um, life altering and really impactful on quality of life when you have to take these kind of measures to have a bowel movement. So let's let's look at these three um, scenarios and identify what type of constipation is this. So 90 year old who complains of frequent episodes of fecal incontinence and has frequent smears of BM in her underwear. Um, an 80 year old who complains of hard stools with straining and abdominal bloating but has daily bowel movements or a 90 year old who complains of having bowel movements only once weekly. So what goes with what? So let's start with the 90 year old. What type of, um, what type of constipation is this? Three? Anyone? Yes, yeah, that's right. Three. What about number two, the 80 year old? One. Correct. And then of course the 90 year old, that's true slow uh, transit constipation. So in terms of epidemiology, the prevalence of constipation in nursing home residents is, is probably at least 50% in most studies, but it's difficult to truly assess because of the difference in definitions and also the over acceptance of this as normal aging. I would also argue that there's a really high prevalence of um, bowel regimen or stool softeners or laxative use. So it's really hard to know um, if you're constipated or, you know, I would guess most patients are. And also depending on the definition you use, there would be a lower prevalence if using the stool prevalence per week. So it's less common to have one stool a week versus the hard stool definition. That makes constipation much more common. People are more likely to report that they're, you know, having hard stools. Um, like I just said, the high frequency of routine stool softeners or laxative use in the nursing home makes the prevalence hard to calculate. Um, in one study, 65% of women and 52% of men reported constipation despite having a bowel movement. So things like this are going to make it difficult to really assess prevalence. One study looking at laxative use in long-term care found that um, about 54% of patients received over 60 doses of bowel meds per month. So I would guess that's like BID dosing. So the majority of patients are on something and more than once a day. So constipation is really cost costly. Um, there's increased utilization of healthcare resources, including primary care visits, GI visits, um, ER visits. An older study from 2008 it saw or showed that there were 8 million annual ambulatory visits with a chief complaint of constipation, so that would be the clinic setting, and over 1 million annual ER visits. So nursing home utilization costs for caring for those with constipation have been estimated to be greater than $2,200 annually. Oops. Um, there's also, I made myself a note, if you, you also have to think about the, the times needed to administer meds, suppositories, or enemas. So that really adds to the medication burden, the care burden, um, the nursing hours. So the pathophysiology is multifactorial. So we'll start at the top. So prolonged a colonic transit time, I wrote um, that with question marks because this is sort of controversial. Like I said, it's likely the lack of a gastrocolic reflex, you know, and, and not really that people have different resting transit times in their colon. 
Um, the second thing is, is a pelvic floor dysfunction. So that's usually leads to a sensation of obstruction and or difficulty with stool evacuation or the, the decreased um, response to a full rectum. They don't have the urge to defecate or not knowing when they have to go. That's all a signs of pelvic floor dysfunction. Underhydration is really prevalent in our patient population. So decreased thirst sensation, diuretic usage, and presence of neurocognitive processes like stroke, um, that make it hard to keep up with your fluid intake. Um, poor dietary intake, so decreased fiber or um, overall, just overall poor caloric intake will lead to constipation because you don't have as much to, to get rid of. Decreased mobility um, and medications are all going into the, into the pathophysiology. So looking at medications, medications, remember that, falls into the secondary um, type of constipation. So all of those medications on the left. So we, we did that case and we saw the antacids, the iron supplements, the opioids, the anticholinergic agents. Our patient was on the TCA. Um, I have a patient in the nursing home that constantly switches between Imodium and um, Dolcolax. So she's either asking, I, I get messages about her all the time. She wants more Dolcolax. And then literally the next day she wants more Imodium. Um, so we play that game with her um, and she's very bowel preoccupied. So I, I never win it. I just give her what she wants when she wants it. The anti-Parkinsonian agents, so that's your cinnamon, the antipsychotics, calcium channel blockers, calcium supplements, diuretics, um, NSAIDs, um, and then the tricyclics. So in terms of diagnosis, we really have to get a good history. And I realize that's not always possible with our nursing home residents, but I wanted to be complete here. Um, and just talk about in an ideal world, what we should ask. So what symptoms are occurring? Is there straining, bloating, hard stools, infrequent stools, abdominal pain, gas? How often are bowel movements occurring? Like I said, I'm always surprised when I ask this question and you know, it might even be twice a day and they're like, I'm so constipated, I'm going twice a day. Um, is there a sense of incomplete evacuation? What bowel regimen, if any, is being used? and a detailed medication review. So looking at what meds might be contributing, what can be um, eliminated. Um, and then no, uh, no um, constipation lecture would be uh, complete without the Bristol stool chart, right? So as part of gathering a detailed history, it's important to ask about stool caliper and consistency of stool. Um, the Bristol stool scale, we've all seen that before. It's a validated tool that assesses stool consistency on a spectrum of seven different types of stool. So from one, which is the hard lumpy stool to water and smooth number seven. And we think that consistency has been shown to be more a more reliable indicator of colonic transit time than stool frequency. So patients who are you know more on the one spectrum probably have delayed more delayed um, uh, transit time, or at least it's sitting in the colon longer um, than those with seven. Those people uh, push it through pretty quickly and aren't able to absorb the water from the stool, which is why you have diarrhea. So exam, we'd ideally, again, this is going to be in an ideal world where the patient can participate. So you would do an abdominal examination. And what you're looking for is, is there, uh, is the abdomen hard or distended or the colon palpable? Um, looking at uh, the external rectal exams, are there hemorrhoids or fissures or warts present? I will never forget when I was a resident, uh, I, I was doing ICU actually, and someone came in with really severe anemia. Um, it was like the lowest hemoglobin I'd ever seen. I think it was around 3.5 or 4. And I was a good resident. So I was going to do my, um, you know, my rectal exam and see what was happening. And I, he turned over in the bed for me to do the rectal exam. And there was this very, very, very large mass protruding out of his rectum. And I just remember being so horrified. I was like, is he going to, he, he wasn't going to tell me about this. Like he mentioned that nowhere in the history. And I just was shocked to see that. So anyway, it, it reminds me that a good rectal exam is very important. So if the patient can cooperate, you ask them to strain. Is there any leakage of stool or rectal prolapse? Um, the... When you ask them to strain, there should be a re relaxation of the sphincter um, and contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. If there's an absence of the relaxation of the sphincter, that's what's going to help you, you know, push the stool out. The sphincter is going to relax and the stool comes out. If there's an absence of this, it may indicate pelvic floor dysfunction or dyssynergy. And then testing the anal wink reflex. So if there's an absence of anal contraction here, you may have some kind of sacral nerve pathology. And then the digital rectal exam. So you're going to assess resting sphincter, sphincter tone and presence of fecal impaction, see if there's an obstruction in there.
So routine use of diagnostic testing is not generally recommended. There are some exceptions or red flags. So if the patient has unexplained anemia, if um, there is a positive fecal occult blood um, sample or rectal bleeding, um, if there's weight loss or any sort of personal or family history of colon cancer, they may be appropriate to consider, not necessarily do, but consider um, more invasive testing. But the most common approach really is empiric treatment of constipation with pharmacological agents and lifestyle modification. So our goals for treatment, we're going to look, we're going to hopefully alleviate the symptoms. And then our goal is really a passage of a, a soft form stool without straining at least three times a week. And then avoidance of complications such as hemorrhoids, anal fissures, and rectal prolapse. And so kind of looking at our algorithm on the right, you know, you start at the top, they're presenting with constipation, are there red flags? No. Then you recommend the stepwise approach. So you have lifestyle modifications with the high fiber diet. Um, again, we'll talk about the evidence behind these, but exercise and increased fluid intake, probably not enough for monotherapy, but maybe part of a stepwise approach. Are the symptoms resolved? Of course, it's, it's no on that usually. And then you would initiate a trial of laxatives and then in a stepwise way add. So we'll go through kind of how we choose what to start first and what how we escalate. So ideally, um, the initial treatment includes lifestyle modifications. So scheduled toileting after meals. So we want to take advantage of that gastrocolic reflex um, increased fluid intake, increased fiber intake, um, again, it may help be helpful, but not probably uh, enough alone um, to make a difference. And then exercise. There's equivocal data on this. We, exercise is the answer for every medical problem, so it's definitely not going to be harmful, but again, probably need something else in addition to that. So other helpful interventions. So placing the feet on a small step stool. Um, we'll look at what that looks like in the next uh, slide while the patient's on the toilet, which it shortens the anal rectal junction and helps um, make it easier to, to expel um, the stool. And then promoting dignity and privacy. I, I think this goes a long way. I mean, we were taught our whole life not to, you know, go to the bathroom in a bed or while laying down. Um, and so I think it's important that this be um, highlighted um, so often, especially in the hospital, I'll hear, oh, just go in your bed. And then, no, we don't do that. We get people up and we toilet them and then encourage, you know, encouraging bowel movements in, in the toilet rather than bedpans or incontinence briefs. And I even hear it in the nursing home, like the nurse told me just to go in my diaper. Um, but that's not, that's not going to solve our problems with constipation and it doesn't promote, you know, patient rights and dignity and privacy. So I put the X on the bedpan there. So I don't know if any of you have heard of the squatty potty. I know the pelvic floor physical therapist that's talked to us before has shown us pictures of these. Um, so basically what this does is it elevates your feet while you're sitting on the toilet and changes that anal rectal junction angle to make it easier to have a bowel movement. Um, so it could be part of your stepwise approach or lifestyle modifications when you recommend it. So in terms of pharmacological treatment, which is where we all are headed usually, um, the first line is osmotic laxatives. So we'll talk about each one of these lines in detail. The second line, stimulant laxatives. The third line, stool softeners. And there's a questionable efficacy in those. Um, and then if still symptomatic, you can consider more expensive medications such as lenactolide or lubiprostone. So for op opioid-induced constipation, um, consider uh, mu op opioid antagonists such as methyl naltrexone. So the first line, osmotic laxatives. So these are non-absorbable and they draw water into the intestinal lumen. And this is what softens the stool. So examples are polyethylene glycol or Miralax, um, sorbitol, lactulose, milk of magnesium or magnesium citrate. So milk of mag and magnesium citrate are, are not really recommended in older adults because of the electrolyte derangement potential. And you really can't, you're not supposed to use them in, in patients with impaired renal function. So let's look at the evidence behind each of these and determine what we think is best. So this was a randomized controlled trial that compared the efficacy of Miralax or polyethylene glycol with psyllium in defecation rate and stool softness. Um, and most of these studies are smaller and they're all old because no one wants to study these agents anymore. They're, most of them are fairly reasonably priced. And so we don't tend to have studies and things that are you know old and cheap. So this uh, included 63 patients, and they did a 14-day follow-up. Um, the medication was di was dosed BID. Um, they found that the Miralax increased the mean weekly defecation rate from one to 
eight and a half, and 84% of uh, patients had softer stools as based on the Bristol stool chart. Um, psyllium increased the mean defecation rate from one, about 1.3 to 5.7. So it does work some, but it's not quite as effective as the uh, Miralax. So, and the, also the Miralax was found to have a more rapid onset and there were no adverse effects in either group. So the take home on this is that Miralax is better than psyllium. So this is a randomized controlled trial that compared the efficacy of sorbitol and lactulose. So included 30 patients over 65 years of age. Um, and there was no statistically significant differences between sorbitol and lactulose. So they're probably fairly equivalent. There was an, a slight increase in nausea with the lactulose group. And this was a meta-analysis that looked at studies comparing lactulose and polyethylene glycol or Miralax. So now we'll look at that. So this included uh, four studies with three or 322 adults. Um, Miralax had a higher stool frequency per week and a softer stool versus lactulose. It also required um, less use of additional products for managing constipation. And then the authors concluded that Miralax or polyethylene glycol really should be used in preference to lactulose for treating chronic constipation. So kind of a summary of that. So we think Miralax is probably the best, followed by lactulose, which is about equal to sorbitol. So our second line here is stimulant laxatives. So these work to increase bowel peristalsis. So the examples of those are bisacoidal or docalax and cine, which is also cinecot. So again, these are so old. The studies from these studies are from the 1970s and included 50 long-term care patients. Um, they looked at Cina versus Dolcolax and found that Dolcolax was more uh, produced a softer and more frequent bowel movements. So third line, um, stool softeners. So we often start with these as our first line, right? But I challenge you after this lecture to consider this these a third line agent. So stool softeners bind to the stool itself, kind of they, they function as a surfactant on the stool itself and increase the amount of water that the stool absorbs to soften it. So our examples there are docusate calcium or docusate sodium. So we usually use uh, docusate sodium or colase. And so although docusate is one of the most commonly prescribed stool regimens, and I would argue it's probably one of the most commonly prescribed medications in America, the data does not support its efficacy. So we've had numerous trials. There's, this is listing. These are old, old and new. So four trials um, in the past like 30 or 40 years, um, and none of them showed any efficacy. Um, so it's just really fascinating when we look at the data behind this, um, because somehow there's no studies that show that docusate actually is any better than placebo, but somehow we spend over $100 million annually in North America on docusate. So this article on the right caught my interest. Um, I like the Choosing Wisely campaign. I usually like to read articles about things that we um, don't choose wisely about, and one of them is docusate. So this is on this is this article specifically is for hospitalized patients but I think it can apply to, to all of our patients. So prescribing practices for docusate have been passed down for decades. No matter how many times on um, the consult service, I tell trauma to stop docusate for someone that's not having a bowel, you know, having bowel movements or for even just starting a routine um, stool regimen and always tell them to stop docusate, they continually prescribe docusate. It just seems to be something that, like I said, is like hereditary, it's passed down. Um, the early studies from the 1950s and 1960s were promising. That's how this trend even got started. But the later data really hasn't been exciting for 40 years. So um, this, this was interesting too when I was looking more into this topic. So this is uh, basically just a, a kind of like a poster presentation essentially at a conference. Um, the conference was the Society for S Surgery of the Ele Elementary Tract. And it was just last year. Um, and they looked at waste reduction at a tertiary academic medical center, our Coleus Crusade. So they reviewed all inpatient admissions for laxative orders over the course of like three years. And they had 92,000, over 92,000 admissions with like 855,000 docusate orders. The top prescribers were trauma, OB, and hospitalist. And the lowest prescribers were GI and palliative. The authors were able, based on this study and based on, you know, they presented the data to the hospital administration that DocuSate hasn't worked in like 60 years, 
and they were able to facilitate the removal of DocuSate from all hospital order sets, and they replaced it with an evidence-based stepwise approach. So that's success on their part. This was um, done in Birmingham, Alabama. So the number one doc doctor recommended treatment on the left there really has no evidence. So that's really the big takeaway message from this lecture. If you learn anything, please just don't prescribe this and think of the choosing wisely campaign, things we do for no reason. So probiotics, this was something I wanted to look into because I've heard some mixed data with that and the data is still kind of mixed. So this in included a, a, systematic, or a systemic review, including five trials of various probiotics for the treatment of constipation and associated symptoms. They couldn't even really do a meta-analysis because the studies were so dissimilar. They couldn't, um, so they had to make it like a systemic review. So two of the trials were conducted only in children. So that left three trials in, in adults. Um, the data suggests that there's a favorable effect of these, um, these um, probiotics on stool frequency and consistency, but there's really not enough patients in the trials and not enough uh, study data that we should really consider this more investigational. But I think probiotics, they, they might be part of our stepwise approach and they, they aren't harmful um, as far as I know, so they, and they may be helpful, something to consider. And then the next slide I left is a placeholder because I might add about lubiprostone in it and like what was it, Linzenza, whatever, Lunas, not Lunasta, that's a sleep agent, but um, the other one that's really expensive, but I didn't put it in because I wanted to see how, how long this took me. And then also we don't tend to use the more expensive agents in the nursing home because they are so expensive. So we'll see what, see if I add that or not. But um, fecal impaction, so that if all of our treatments fail or if we don't get you know treatments in place in time, we really need to um, treat fecal impaction because it can lead to more serious complications. Um, you know, uh, I have seen perforation one time when I worked at Depend Hospital from fecal impaction and the patient ended up dying. Um, so this requires treatment with mineral oil or tap water enema and or manual disimpaction. So impaction, how you can gain this from the history, it's suggested by if, if the patient tells you they have constipation, but they often have diarrhea, and you might want to consider this might be an overflow diarrhea. So you've got the hard stool ball that sits in the colon and kind of the more liquid stool kind of flows around it, or else you might get the history of there's been no stool output and there's a tender firm abdomen, usually pretty distended. You should avoid long-term use of magnesium-based lax laxatives, like we said, so i.e. magnesium citrate or milk of mag due to the electrolyte balance potential. So this wouldn't really, we wouldn't really want to treat any sort of fecal impaction from above as much as we would just mean enemas. So kind of looking at the sort of the punchlines, uh, We've got some recommendations on the left here. So increased exercise is, does not improve symptoms of constipation in nursing home residents or older adults. That does have an evidence A rating. Um, again, it might be part of a comprehensive treatment plan, but alone probably isn't gonna get you where you need to be. Um, Miralax is preferred over lactulose because it is more effective and has fewer side effects. And that is um, a treatment level A. So Linz S, that's the word I was trying to see, linactylide and lubiprostone are more effective than placebo. So we got B there. And then our peripherally acting mu antagonists, which I didn't really talk about much in this lecture, are more effective than placebo. So that's pretty good evidence rating. And I crossed out the stool softeners because obviously these people haven't read the Choosing Wisely papers and the waste in the tertiary care centers and all the studies that have been done in the last 50 years on DocuSafe. So our suggested algorithm, again, from the same article, I crossed off the stool softeners. Oops. Um, so, you know, of course, we're going to start with our stepwise approach, which is um, lifestyle interventions if possible. Um, and then Miralax, and then move on from there. So stimulant laxatives, and then consider more expensive agents. So our take-home message is constipation and long-term care um, is common and costly. The treatment regimen should be multifactorial and include lifestyle modifications. So our most supporting evidence, this is probably the punchline in the whole um, lecture, Miralax, followed by lactulose, which is equal to sorbitol. And then stimulant laxatives with some evidence for efficacy, probably Dolcolax is better than Cinna. And then stool softeners such as DocuSate or bulking agents are often not better than placebo. Um, and that's it.